mundo nos preguntamos qué es esto de la inteligencia. Sin embargo, hay muy pocos que se preocupan por entender si los animales, si los invertebrados tienen inteligencia y cómo se define. Jennifer Mater, hoy invitada a la Ciudad de las Ideas, a este programa de Proyecto 40, coproducido con Poder Cívico, nos, nos lleva al mundo de los pulpos y su inteligencia o su falta de ella. Quédese con nosotros. Jennifer Mather, psicóloga y bióloga marina. Sus investigaciones se centran en el estudio de pulpos y calamares. Las dos especialidades de Jennifer, psicología y biología marina, no son tan diferentes como parecen. Trabajando con cefalópodos durante años, ha estudiado sus formas de comunicación e interacción, dos áreas importantes de estudio para la psicología. Sus investigaciones son únicas porque no implican el elemento humano. Sin embargo, ella plantea cuestionamientos psicológicos de los animales. Nos encontramos en Long Beach, California, con Jennifer Mother, quien es canadiense y, bueno, nos va a hablar de un tema fundamental, la inteligencia, pero desde una perspectiva distinta. ¿Qué no sabemos de la inteligencia que hoy podríamos saber sobre todo a través de una persona que no solamente se ha dedicado a la biología, sino a la psicología, pero lo ha tratado de entender a través de estudios de campo de los animales, en particularmente de los pulpos. It's really an honor to have you here in this interview. Thank you. Really, it's, it's really an honor. And more because of the work that you have been doing. The, the first question I will do it is, how would you introduce yourself? Who are you? Oh goodness, I would say... What do you do? I'm a psychologist, I'm a university professor, I'm fascinated with the intelligence of animals, and I'm also very, very interested in good teaching. Right. Did you start being a bi biologist? And then... That's correct. Um, so. There are people who study animal behavior in psychology, we call it comparative psychology. But it's an area that overlaps with biology, and particularly for me since it was marine animals. I started as an undergraduate in a biology department. I got my master's in biology, and I switched to psychology to work with a professor who was interested in the behavior of octopuses. Why, why study animals and, and particular octopus to understand intelligence in general? Because when we study human intelligence, we have only the one model, the model of us. And if we say, well, how do animals show intelligence, then we can look at, we hope, different models. But if you look at animals that are closely related to us, like primates, then you end up saying, well, there are different facets of the same model. Whereas if you look at the octopus, they are not related to us. So if they have developed intelligence, they may have, and in fact they have, developed it in a different way. We will have, as, as I mentioned to you, this festivity, La Ciudad de las Ideas in Puebla, yeah. November 6, 7, and 8 of, of, of this year. And one of the topics, of course, is Darwin, and it's yes. called re-evolution, uh -huh. coming from evolution. Yeah. Can, can, can we talk a little bit about if octopuses and other animals have had intelligence that have been evolving, that they have been, with the time, really becoming more intelligent in a way? Um. Well, octopuses are mollusks, and when everybody thinks mollusks, they think clams and snails, which do not have large brains, do not have a high de development of intelligence. And in fact, the cephalopods that octopuses are part of, this particular group, probably when, you know, you can't say it anthropomorphically, they didn't get rid of the protective shell and then develop intelligence, but their evolution clearly went along the lines of loss of protection, gaining uh, some other way to avoid being eaten. And this was uh, good sensory capacity, very, very interesting complex motor control, and a highly centralized brain. What 
so far, what have been like your big discoveries and how can we apply that to, to our real life? Why, why is this important, actually? One of the things that was the most fun that I found about octopuses is that they play. And this is something that we presume that highly intelligent animals do. And this is something that we had never thought that an invertebrate did. And it's very interesting to think about because play obviously is the exertion of intelligence exploring the environment and gaining information from the environment and figuring out what to do about the environment. So that for me was quite exciting. I'm an ignorant, I'm sorry because of the questions that I'm making to you, but in terms of how can you really know that they are playing and not doing other things okay. for Okay, if you look reasons? at Berghardt's four characteristics of play, it fits them, okay? Okay. But the particular thing that we saw, do you have time for me to talk sure, all about please, it? please, please. please. If you want an animal to play, you should make it comfortable, you should make it warm, you should make it well fed, you should make it bored, okay. and then you should give it something to do something with. So we put the octopuses in a big aquarium tank and we gave them a floating pill bottle, nothing else. This is one of my favorite experiments because it cost nothing. These were used pill bottles. Sure. Okay. And it turned out that at the far end of the tank, there was a water inflow. And the octopus was sitting here. And the water inflow would bring the floating bottle to the octopus. And the octopus reached out with its siphon, its funnel, and jetted a jet of water, which sent mm -hmm. the pill bottle to the far end, where the current picked it up and brought it back. Mm -hmm. And that once, you wouldn't consider to be play. But we had two animals out of our eight that did this over 20 times. And in fact, my colleague Roland Anderson, who was conducting this work at the Seattle Aquarium, phoned me in great excitement and said, she's bouncing the ball. <laughs> and it is just like how we would bounce a ball. Now, it's a real problem, by the way, because with all the work that I've done, I've kind of looked at things that people would recognize as being the sign of intelligence in us. But I'm probably not looking at the full range of abilities of this animal because I should be looking at intelligence as it should be in them. But if I can find personalities and I can find play and people say, oh, yeah, but we do that and we're smart, then that helps to build the parallel. There are ways that I'd like to explore beyond what we can do to look at what they specialize in. And I've done a little bit of that. All this development that has been done with a uh the genetics and the information that each uh, particular species has in its own genetical code. Yeah. Can we learn something about intelligence within a specific uh, species like, like octopuses, just knowing their, their, their gene structure? Well, if it doesn't work for us, and it doesn't, I bet it won't work for them because our intelligence is the result of many, many, many genes and environmental interaction. So my guess is it won't work for them. We can, we can mention, I can affirm that there have been an evolution of intelligence in human beings. Right. Can we say the same things with, with octopuses? Well, it must have been, yes. Okay. Because ultimately any characteristic of animals does not prevail without natural selection. So yes, it must have. But just exactly how it was selected for? That's a very good question. If you think of the capacity animals have for behavior, of all the, it's not that clams and snails are stupid, they do very adaptive things, but the capacity for a variety of behavior is far larger in the octopuses and the squid than it is in the other mollusks. So I didn't come to it from trying to look at intelligence. I came to it from being fascinated by the animals and then slowly finding out the kinds of things they do.
you know, for, for human beings, we have a lot of evaluations to know the rate of intelligence and the scale of intelligence that you have. Well, more or less, there, have a, there, there are problems, but in a way, there is a scale and you can compare them. Right. Do we have something like that for, for this animal? No, but people have tried to decide if they are, for instance, more intelligent than fish or more intelligent than uh, reptiles, some of which turn out to be a lot smarter than we thought. Mm. Are they more intelligent? They're probably in with mammals, but exactly which mammals, it depends upon what you're looking at. But what would be the reason that people should listen to this and know and understand the intelligence in octopuses in relation with humans? We should understand the diversity of animals. We should care about the diversity of animals. We should, in particular, be looking to marine animals because the ocean makes up more of the planet than the uh, continents do. In fact, we shouldn't be calling this around us, Earth. We should be calling it water. I agree. And there's much to learn about the ocean. There's much to care about about the animals. And think of E.O. Wilson and how strongly he felt about saving biodiversity. We have to not just save it, but also appreciate it. I mentioned to you well, that, that this year is called Revolution, yeah. and Edward Wilson, for many years, was really like a taboo. He was very criticized. All his theories of ethology and doing what he was doing of sociobiology was, in, and now he's very well accepted in many right. ways. And this is the year of Darwin. What can you tell us a little bit about that? And I'm also interested to what you're doing. Because if we really study what Darwin did and the origins of life, a lot of things started with, with, with most of, I mean, life started in the water oh, yeah. and with these molecules and then these amphibians, etc. So I also like very much what you're doing because take us to our origins, but I don't know if you could elaborate on this. Well, I actually did a study with a colleague, which we haven't published yet, but we will one of these days looking at how people felt about invertebrates. Now, in, uh, E.O. Wilson said invertebrates are the little things that hold up the planet. Hmm. And in fact, they're 99% of the animals on the planet, by number and also wow. by volume. So one of the things we did, we went to an introductory psychology class and we asked them what they thought about these different invertebrate animals. And then we told them about our research, because I work on octopuses and he works on um, grasshoppers, locusts. And then we looked again to see whether it had made a difference to their opinions. And yes, it did. I think we need much more publicity about these interesting, varied, very competent animals because they're the substance of the planet, not us. OK. Don't believe everything you think. I mean, the world is so diverse. And we have to, to have this curious mind that you share with us that I, I really appreciate it. What I just said, I think, is absolutely the core of what we need to get across to people, that there are many, many animals. They're in many different habitats. They're small. They're large. They're unknown to us. The, the excitement, I feel, is exploring something new. I mean, I think this is very relevant, especially this year, where, yeah. because of Darwin. What, what can we tell to the people in terms of this curiosity what Darwin did in 1831 of taking this, this cruise to, 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 well, right. to Africa, to South America, then to the Galapagos, and then again going back to, to England, and, uh, what, and, and collecting all these species, and, and looking what's going on in the oceans, yes, yes, in the yes. water, in the plants, etc. I think this is something that we have lost in many ways. Probably not the people that were born oh, in yes. Victoria, but I mean, <laughs> if you come here to Los Angeles or the, it's like out of our world, and we talk about diversity, but we're really not connected to it. Yep. What should we do? There's a lot of biologists who are very concerned about this. They say that children now don't have good contact with the natural world. They don't go out as I did to the beach. They don't go out as a friend of mine did, um, taking pictures of birds in the swamps. 
and he and I have talked about this, we have said there aren't enough naturalists anymore. There aren't enough people who go out and look. And even though the work that I'm talking about here at TED is actually lab work, I'm a real fanatic about field work. I think that out there where the animals live is where you should be studying them. And I, I also have the good sense to choose very nice places to study. So I have studied octopuses in Hawaii. I have studied them in Bermuda. And I've studied the squid in um, the island of Bonaire, which is in the Southern Caribbean. If you're going to do observation in the ocean, right, then sure. you want to have a warm ocean. Because okay. if you're going to do observation, you have to stay as still as possible. And even at 28 degrees centigrade, you will get cold. In addition, I have volunteers coming to help me. And so I have to make it reasonably nice for them. The, the main thing is the temperature. It has to be a warm temperature. It also has to be what I call protected. I'm sure. not going to take volunteers to a place that's not safe. So the places that I have chosen have all these criteria, safe, 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 and warm. Jennifer, <clears throat> if, if I think that there is, among other applicability,